Hey, Reef Builders, welcome to Reef Therapy Session number 69. Hold it together, Raj. Mark is still out backpacking, so we've got a special guest on the show today. It might be hard to get us to open up, uh, Chris Meckley, but we're going to try our best. Uh, the owner of ACI Aquaculture, Mr. Chris Meckley, thank you for joining us on the show today. We appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me on, guys. I'm um, happy to do it with you. It's going to be a good time. Off the bat, I just wanted to send a huge congratulations to Windsor Adams, who delivered a happy, healthy baby boy a couple weeks ago. Do me a favor, congratulate her in the comment section below. So happy for her. Uh, Reef Adams is his name. Reef Jacob Windsor Adams. Reef Adams. Uh, he was on our call today, and he is the most adorable little thing you've ever seen, you know? That's it. It's the best <laughs> meeting ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, I talked to him yeah. this, this evening. Um, and she said that she was uh, on with the uh, call this afternoon and said that uh, it was Reef's first uh, Reef Builders um, meeting. Yep. And uh, he was good the whole way through it from what she said. Yeah. I didn't hear any crying uh, at she, all. She said she just wishes that she would learn to sleep when um, the little guy sleeping because she had, I guess, was coming up on a four-hour nap that he had. And she had taken a nap at all herself. So uh, she's yeah. going to be in for a treat this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the Luke, routine is the toughest. Yeah. Sorry, Luke, go. Luke's coming in. Um, was supposed to be there early today. Jake's, Jake's brother was flying in to see Reef today, and um, he, he got delayed. So like, I'm just going to hand him off so that I can go sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel like routine is always the hardest thing whenever you get a newborn. And then once you get it or you think you've got it, it changes. So <laughs> uh, good luck to uh, Windsor and Reef. It's I just I think that's just awesome that uh, everything is good, happy, healthy. So go ahead and congratulate her in the comment section below. Uh, what you guys drinking tonight? Chris? Got a yingling. Class. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very nice. Raj, what do you got? I uh, switched it up. Still local beer. Uh, Terrapin Brewing. This is one of their new ones. The Depth Perception. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, okay. It's an IPA. Yeah. 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 They yeah. got three different. Uh, I had family here over the weekend. Three different. And they, they rated everything. So now I just have seltzer. That's pretty Seltzer. <laughs> don't you have any liquor yep. in the cabinet you can dump a little rum no, or something I, in it <laughs> i do but chris it is a tuesday night so <laughs> I, i'll be i'll be good with this one trust me the, yeah, yeah, yeah uh raj anything you want to vent about tonight to get us started i don't know about vent but i did get a beer recommendation in the comments which was uh which was new and it's cool so now i have to hunt for this new sweet water i thought i had every single one of them i was telling chris i have a a beer fridge i don't know why we're pivoting into beer but here we are and i have this beer <laughs> fridge with uh, i thought it was every single beer that Sweetwater made and then some other different beers but um yeah i, I don't have this particular one so i have to go look for sweet Baby Jesus beer by Sweetwater Brewing. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a I, new one. Never I, heard of that. I commented on it and I was like, it's almost like IPAs or microbrew beer names are like zoanthid names yes. to us, right? That's perfect. <laughs> Everything's got a name nowadays, but they don't even know the species. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, I mean, did you have anything else, Raj? I still have done absolutely zero on my tank. Zero. Okay, zero. that's good. Just, I'm glad just we have so an update there. Have that clear. <laughs> There's been no progress since last week. <laughs> zero progress. Uh, Chris, this is a therapy session. Anything you, uh, anything reef related that's been bugging you lately you want to get off your chest? There's always something bothering me about the, the reefing world that I need to get off my chest. Uh, <laughs> where do you want me to begin? <laughs> we could go Start for hours about one. just one topic. Um, <laughs> uh, What's going on with your systems? Tell us about your tanks. Man, I'll tell you what, I've been so happy with my systems lately. Um, I've got such a, a great uh, group of people that are working for me and um, I've got some really good people on my side. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a chemist. I'm not, uh, but I'm a, a very experienced hobbyist and I love the chemistry aspect of reefing. I love just, um, 
dialing things in and seeing what really happens when the ones that say you don't need minor and traces in your system, what I can actually prove is better for the system with adding minor and traces. And um, lately we've been doing, I, mean, I, I, I'm such a geek with this right now. And I have a really good friend of mine that has an ICP company close by and I do an ICP test on a weekly basis. And um, I got addicted to that. And um, just my ultimate goal is to make sure that I get my systems dialed in according to natural seawater parameters as close as I can. And it's really fun really frustrating and just there's so many variables that you'll never understand why things happen the way they do um but i keep trying and um i think that's um probably one of the things that keeps me really tuned in with my corals and i observe them constantly and i learned a lot just by playing around with a handful of parameters that um, like, you know, pH is the one thing that has changed my reefing, you know, how I reef forever. Um, it's just amazing what you can do with um, minor and trace elements and um, keeping a stable pH and not chasing alkalinity all the time. I have to say, um, anybody that listens to me and sees what we do, um, it's not for everybody because it's a little bit more detailed but it actually is a lot less expensive for a reefer to maintain their system doing it the way we do it. For my tank, same old, same old, I made the crucial error of unplugging my ATO during a maintenance and I forgot to plug it back in. You know who would never have that problem is Jake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the corals were not very happy in that tank because I think it, the ATO was gone for maybe two days. It, it rose uh, then. Uh, yeah, so it went yeah. up, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, salinity went up and... Uh, I think it's down back to normal now and it looks like all the polyps are are out on the on the leathers in there but yeah it was that's you know just one of those mistakes that i feel like happens whenever you are unplugging things and plugging things in and doing maintenance on a tank and just kind of trying to do it quickly because there's ten thousand other things that need to be done in the house and kids yelling and all that <laughs> kind of stuff going on so that's why i don't have a tank at home yeah, it always, it, it's always funny to me how people in the like there's so many people in the industry, Raj, Chris, that don't have tanks at home and you just kind of leave it all at work because you get enough of it, you know, setting them up and doing all that. Um, do you shut things off on your tank when you do water changes? Do I? Yeah. Yeah. With uh, there's a couple things uh, on the frag tank. I shut off the flow. Um on my lagoon i unplug the ato or i turn off the ato just because it's it's super annoying it'll start yelling at me because it you know it fills up in the back uh but that's just small tank stuff you know it's just just what you kind of got to do in a small tank uh, but i'm hoping with a bigger tank you know maybe i won't have to shut off as much stuff as i'm as i'm cleaning and getting around things so yeah i hated shutting anything off i would leave everything running and do it do the water changes with the return pump going just you know what if it ran dry it ran dry for a little bit and it would kick right back up but yeah yeah i don't i was just always afraid i'd do the same thing i would forget to plug something in or i'd plug it in and then it wouldn't want to start and just you know all those gremlins yeah so many yeah. gremlins especially with our systems the way they were when we did our water changes and I'm so happy that we just devised this way of doing things where we don't do water changes on any of our systems unless it's necessary. Um, you know, for one, instead of making two 1200 gallon salt vats weekly, we now make one every two to three weeks, you know, just for packing out. And that's been a huge money savings aspect for us, but it also is a lot of labor that's not necessary. And, um, again, like Raj said, you don't have to worry about not plugging something back in or because yeah. <laughs> I was never guilty of not plugging things back in. Cause I was so anal about my, you know, everything I do with my coral systems, but it was the employees. I could go back in and, uh, double check everything. And there's a, uh, very important little pump that you wouldn't even know wasn't running until your alkaline dropped to the floor because you didn't, you know, it wasn't plugged back into the calcium reactor or something. So all of my, I guess, um, changing of the way we reef was all to eliminate 
as much human error as possible. And now if there's human error, it's all in me because I won't let anybody do anything except for, you know, additives and stuff like that, except for me because it's just you know, too touchy. But it makes things a lot easier for us around the farm. 18,000 gallons of water is a lot of water to do water changes on. And I don't have to do it anymore. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of public aquariums do that on their really, really large systems. They're not doing water changes. They're just implementing other ways to clarify that water and uh, pull out the nutrients. And so I have to dose nutrients is the biggest problem ever. Ever since I started doing all the minor and trace dosing and stabilized my pH at 8.3 on average, um, I literally, every system except for the two wild coral systems, uh, and I don't run protein skimmers on those, so I'm sure that's the reason why the uh, nutrients are fairly stable. Um, but all the other systems with skimmers and scrubbers and minor and trace dosing and you know not really getting many alerts for any deficiencies in those minor and traces, having all of that you know uh, balanced and having the ionic balance in your system, the microfauna that's in there, the microbiome in there is more diverse. And nutrients are a problem for me in a, in the, for the fact that I have them on a dosing pump 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because I can't, if I take them off, it strips to zero and my corals bleach out, they stress out and just try to keep everything at like eight, um, what is it, four, 12, 10 to 14 on nitrates and um, like 0 0.03, 0 0.07 on, on phosphates. And that was actually a, a, a real chore to try to figure out how much of each of them to put into a concoction that gets dosed on a monthly basis. And then is it going to change? And um, I think the first six months I had to continue to up the amount of um, nitrate and phosphate that went into the solution to be dosed until we finally have it dialed in. I don't think I've changed that regimen now. It's two months in a row. So um, it's uh, so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> so much nicer. I mean, algae problems that were just a nightmare. You know, when you have all the fragments that we have at our farm, it, it, you know, I used to pay somebody to scrub frag plugs daily. And then we were talking about one system's like 30 to 50,000 frag plugs in there at any given time. And that dude hated, hated me so bad. I'm surprised he stuck it out as long as he did because he sat back there and scrubbed with a toothbrush every single frag plug all week long. And I'm um, so glad I don't have to put anybody through that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 has changed because i feel like i would say as recent as five years ago we're watching you know brs videos about these ultra low nutrient systems and now all of a sudden the story is we're all dosing phosphates and nitrates into our tank now is it the i mean what's changed in reefing to where now we're having just such a shortage of it are we are we are we too good at taking out a nutrient export at this point? <sighs> Raj, you deal with equipment <laughs> on that end of it. I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> well, I mean, our, our filtration has gotten a lot better. Life support has evolved, right? Our, our setups back in the day were really, really basic. I mean, if you think about what the definition of a sump was back when you know we started reefing, it was just a tank where you put stuff, right? Like that was the literal definition. And <laughs> now it's changed. It's an actual piece of filtration equipment. You have mechanical, you have biological, and you, you, you've got your prone seed skimmer, you've got chemical, you've got so many different tools that we are doing a much better job. Well, we know a lot more now too. But you look at the mechanical filtration, right? It, it's gotten finer and finer and finer. And now with the roller systems, you've got something that is great for lazy reefers like me because you don't have to tend to it all the time. You just let it roll and let it run for months or months at a time. Um, there, gosh, there was a guy on Facebook that commented somewhere that he hasn't changed his filter roll in a year. That's phenomenal. That is. Uh, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, we, you know, we now know what medias to use and in what ratios and what the frequency of changing them is before we were just making it up we knew hey just use carbon now now there's different grades of carbon and we know how long it can absorb before it starts fouling uh, you know we know really what to do with gfo there's different types of gfos now and and now there's different type of 
medias period that we didn't have you know that uh, ccam's got one that they call a protein skimmer in a bag because you put those beads in a in what, what what are those media bags and toss it in your sump so there's just so many more tools now i think we do do a better job but we've also gotten better at our husbandry skills i think we do you know more water changes than we used to do um I mean, I, I know the reefers I knew back in the day, we were pretty bad at doing the water changes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's because we were poor ass uh, college students and we were just trying not <laughs> to spend money on salt yeah. or if it was that we, you know, just truly hated doing it or we're just bad at it or didn't believe that you really needed to do it because your tank doesn't look bad after one week or two weeks or, you know, three missed water changes. It, it takes a while. It, you know, it, it, it's... Um... I think uh, 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 for us and what we do, I think a lot of it has to do with just the way, you know, I, I'm still very old school, very simplistic approach for filtration, um, you know, very minimal amount of live rock, um, you know, a protein skimmer and an algae scrubber. I mean, I really think that the algae scrubber was one of the things that really changed my whole perspective on, on reefing because I was always a refugium type person. And after... All the do you think the scrubber has actually done anything for you? I swear by algae scrubbers. I just got uh, mm. two more. Um, if it wasn't for algae scrubbers and minor and trace dosing, I would not be. Um, I, I would have extra employees just to just to scrub frack books. Let's put it that way. That was the whole reason why I even jumped on the on the algae scrubber thing, was because, you know. And sometimes it was two two employees. I mean, you know, for weeks and weeks of just constant scrubbing because you get this nuisance algae growth. And when I got my scrubbers and put them on in December five years ago in 2019, I wasn't a believer in February. I was like, these things don't work. They're junk. There's something wrong. There's, it doesn't do any better than what a refugium does. I'm still paying somebody to scrub my, you know, my frag plugs and clean, change out the racks and. And then it was like all of a sudden in um, March of that, it was the beginning of March, I had my, my crew doing their normal scrubbing of the plugs. And the next week they came in and they were, we were looking at everything and I'm like, where'd the algae go? It, it just didn't come back um, after we cleaned it off. And I did notice that it was getting a little bit less on the plugs and on the, the rocks. Um, but it was just like, all of a sudden the light bulb got turned on and the nutrient levels weren't to the levels they needed to be at for this nuisance algae to grow. And m meantime, for the entire three months, I was changing or I was cleaning the scrubbers off, to, you know, every single week because they were getting so full that it was just falling off into the tanks. And um, I swear by the things, guys. I mean, um, if you don't have success with an algae scrubber, more than likely it's because you're stripped of all the minor and trace elements that the algae needs to grow and to do its job. And that was where the whole minor and trace dosing really um, started coming in with me because they worked amazing from March until August. And then they started going. So what, what do you think that they are stripping from your tank? I think that they're growing the algae that would grow on the reef itself. And the type of algae that would grow on them, that would grow on the reef next to the corals, there's – a relationship there and the reason why it happens. I'm not, again, I'm not a scientist. I don't understand it all 100%, but the algae that we're harvesting from our scrubbers is the same nasty stuff that we would see growing in the reef, but it's now growing on the scrubber. And it took, like I said, about three months for that to happen. But once it happened, it didn't stop. And it just stopped growing where I didn't want it um, until August. And then, um, Everything just changed. My phosphate started going back up. My nitrate started going back up. And I'm going, what the hell am I doing different? And um, that's when I sent off a handful of ICP tests and uh, found out that all my minor and traces were completely stripped, including copper, um, manganese, cobalt, iron was super important. Um, so I found the good trace supplement at the time. And... I started getting the scrubbers doing their job again and started keeping my phosphate levels back to where I wanted them to be. 
so then I had to start, you know, continuously dosing that. And I was using hobbyist grade stuff and it became such a money pit for me. I was, I think it was like six, $700 a month on just one system in minor and trace dosing. And I'm like, this has got to be something better out there for me to do. And, um, it was really funny how it all worked out. I had enough to last me through, I think it was March of 2020 on my supplements. And uh, COVID hits and I'm going, oh shit, how am I gonna get this stuff in here now? It's gonna be a hard time, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna have all this problems. Should I just shut the scrubber down, deal with the, wait a minute, if I do that, then I'm gonna have to hire employees and ain't nobody gonna go to work right now. Luckily, a buddy of mine, Chris Wood, got back into the industry right you know, at the same time I was, um, that COVID came about and um, he started his new product line. And the first thing that we started working on was the minor and trace supplement that he was going to develop for somebody using an algae turf scrubber. And that evolved tremendously since then. But um, once I got back into that, that was uh, made it very affordable for me to dose the system with minor and traces and then um, just making sure I did ICP tests every week. And you don't have to do that. If you're reefing, you do not have to be a geek like me and spend all that money on ICP tests. We do seven, nine tests every single week. Um, I don't think that that's really affordable for a lot of reefers to do. Um, once a month is good. Um, but once you start doing like a minor and trace supplement, I do one after 10 days just to make sure you're not overdosing your system because minor and trace elements is exactly what it means, minor and trace. If you overdose them, just a... Uh, two or three parts per billion can be a major catastrophe in your aquarium um, or be the start of a major catastrophe. And if you don't know what's happening, um, I don't recommend you continue unless you're doing at least one test a month with minor and trace elements. Um, but if you eliminate water changes, you can afford to do the ICP test. Is that the schedule you'd recommend? Just monthly ICPs? Um, it all depends. In the very beginning, um, depending on the issues you're having with your system, I, I deal with people all the time. I get messages from all over the world um, about minor and trace dosing. And I like to see ICP test results and I like to know what's being dosed. And I can really help people out tremendously with um, a good regimen to go on. And it's always good to take it slow with minor and traces. Um, it's never good to do um, it's always good to start off for the first 10 days, like the normal full dose that the manufacturer recommends. After that, you have no idea where your levels are until you do that first test. So after 10 days, I recommend that you put the, the elements in the way it says. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to plug anybody, but I use the Captivate product, the Reef Blueprint, and it's, he recommends after 10 days, Chris, my friend, recommends after 10 days to do the ICP test. As a matter of fact, um, the Reef Builder Studio has um, minor uh, isolated MT. I send out a bottle of it so that uh, Jack could um, start doing the dosing on that because I know Jake was doing it um, before he passed and um, he loved the results that he was getting. And I want Jack to have that same success so that when Remy goes out and does his uh, tours of the studio, he can see the, the beauty that, uh, that Jake got to see. Um, but yeah, the, after 10 days, do an ICP test and then um, back your dose down until you get the results. And if you have any elevations, then your best bet is to start dosing individually uh, on top of the supplement that you are using, which usually there's a bunch of different products out there. The MT from Isolate uh, by Reef Blueprint has a bunch of them in one particular product, but you always end up having to dose um, certain elements like manganese and cobalt, iron, vanadium. Um, and now selenium for me, which was something for two years, I never had the dose. It was always elevated. And now something changed after my balance got put into play with um, the other elements that I was struggling to get balanced in the, the right ratios. Then um, once everything else balanced out, then selenium just bottomed out to nothing. So now I'm dosing a lot of that. But yeah, just 10 days, back off your dose, do a test, see what your levels are. And if everything seems to be perfectly fine, then I would say just continue with the dose. And then about uh, three weeks later, I would do a, another ICP test. And if you're doing minor and trace dosing with um, in your system, the myth of water changes was to uh, replenish your minor and trace elements. But in reality, all it did was replace them for a very short period of time because it wasn't getting them back to natural seawater levels. And if you get them to natural seawater levels with testing and dosing, you don't have to do water changes anymore. Yeah. We actually have a code RT10 at ICP analysis.com for 10% off an ICP test. 
There you, you go. There you uh, go. Uh, horrible. I, <laughs> Chris, Chris, I wanted to ask you about the the size of your algae scrubbers. Is there some? Is there a ratio to the size of the screen or anything like that? Because I know you're working with thousands of gallons worth of water. Um, or are you are you using like a hobbyist grade scrubber? What what's your what's your thought on the size of it? Well, you know, um, clear water scrubbers are the scrubbers that we use. Um, Josh Johnson um, approached me back in nineteen, and I got them. And he was still learning about them. He was very very adamant about the scrubber doing a really good job, but he didn't have a whole ton of data on them, and um, he basically hooked me up with one of his commercial size scrubbers, which is the 300. And in the beginning, he thought that that was only going to handle a 600 gallon aquarium. Um, so I got the commercial, which was two of them side by side. And I, he wanted me to put two of them on 2,500 gallons. And I was like, I got nowhere to put two. I can put one, you know, these things were like you know, 24 inches long, you know, okay. like that wide. I had one spot that I could put one of these things. And if I wanted to put a second one on, I'd have to modify a bunch of stuff. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. So I put it on and I actually got such good results from that on 2,500 gallons. And he said it was supposed to be good for around 1,500. He learned a lot. I taught him so much about his scrubbers that he had no idea he was going to learn. And he thanks me every day for it. I just talked to him this afternoon, um, you know, because he's got his new uh, all-in-one uh, system out with uh, the scrubber built in, which is a really cool concept. I like it a lot. But now he's recommending like the smallest one that he makes is the 50. Um, that's good for like 150 to 200 gallon tank. And that's literally like this big. It, it's, but it runs for 24 straight hours too. If you wanted to run a, a bigger scrubber screen, you run it for less time. Um, I actually have my biggest farm system is 5,000 gallons. And I had uh, the commercial one on that was on 2,500. And I ran it for four hours a day because I just wanted to keep algae growing on the screen because my nutrients were so stripped out. But um, yeah, it, it, I think that uh, the the to answer your question properly, Remy, um, I think that scrubbers, it's going to deter dependent upon your nutrient load, your your biodiversity, and um, of course your reefing skills. If you're a if you're an overfeeder, you want to put a big boy on there. If you're, you know, like to feed your fish, you know, twice a day, don't really feed your corals, you know. Uh, a 50 could probably run a 300 gallon aquarium with no problems and help keep the nutrients low. Um, but you would have to just play around with it and see what happens. Do you have many fish in your systems? Man, do I ever have fish in my systems. I love my fish. Um, uh, I have a harem of tangs in each one and it's a misfit school. There's a, the thousand gallon tanks. They're 12. But, it, but a much lower density than a, display tank would have no right so so you're no i'm an addict no? i swear to you I, i'm telling you <laughs> if you know anything about me i am addicted to this industry this hobby the coral the reef anything i there's probably 70 tangs in a thousand well, gallons we, we talked about that last last week and it's called a lifestyle it's not an addiction exactly okay. exactly i, I say that all the time too uh, it, it's definitely a lifestyle for sure <laughs> So you said right. you had look for that on the reef builders merch site. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bumper sticker or something for sure. You it said you had 70, 70, you have 70 tangs in a thousand gallon system. That's not including the probably 30, 40 rashes, um, mandarin, scooter blennies, um, calibit damsel. 70, 70. 70. Calibit ange or calibit, uh, damsels, um, damsels. springer eye damsels, um, <sighs> yeah, I, I have a lot of fish, and actually, I just I just ordered another probably fifteen hundred fish um, for all of my systems to to be up because uh, I, I, most of them are just small, like Springer eyes and Talbots that are used for like the wild coral systems. When the corals come in, you know, they're always full of the Planarian, um, the ones everybody hates, which are really not a big deal unless they become plague proportions, the little flatworms. But the Talbots and the Springer eyes. Um, mandarins and scooter blennies and stuff like that they do an amazing job at helping keeping keep them under control and uh we had a little bit of an outbreak and i'm like yeah i think we're a little bit low on springer eyes and talibits you know they end up thinning themselves out to a pair in like 
this side of the tank and another pair on this side of the tank and we put 40 of them in the daggone tank you know they just thin themselves out over time plus um i love bangai cardinals so there's probably like six or seven hundred bangai cardinals in my entire farm that's the worst <laughs> fish ever <laughs> they're so stupid <laughs> They're dumb. Dumbfish. I love the babies. I see babies everywhere. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Do you, do, what's... Do you have little baby urchins in there for them to play with? Um, I used to um, until I'm a cheap ass. So every, every bit of equipment in my place is used pretty much um, when it comes to like uh, aquariums and tubs. Um, I bought an African cichlid farm tank or all of these tanks when he went out of business. And then we um, epoxy painted them with the marine epoxy paint that um, is, uh, we put like four coats on there, but um, yeah, the urchins ended up having to leave because they, uh, once the coral and algae started growing, they were chin there chowing away. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Why is there holes in my freaking paint? <laughs> and then uh, we, we learned that the urchins were just taking it right off. So uh, yeah, they went bye-bye. What's your longest, or what's the fish that you've had the longest, or are there any, that, or do you keep track? Um, it has to be my uh, arm shoulder tang. Fish. It's an arm shoulder Dang. tang. I don't have any clownfish. I, actually, no, I have one clownfish. I don't know how he got there. Um, he's just in one of my <laughs> coral systems. I have no idea where he came from. Uh, <laughs> what kind of clown? It's a tomato. Actually, it's... um. Not the tomato. It's in the same. It's I think it's the same species. The one that um, melanopus. It's a melanopus. Mm. Is that is that tomato? Okay. I'm not good with my Latin names on fish. You can give me corals all day long, but don't hold it against me if I don't know my Latin names on fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's. I was hoping it was going to be a maroon because they're the biggest assholes <laughs> on clownfish. Amanda's got. Um, <laughs> we had a pair of maroon clowns when I met Amanda um, in '98. We, um, she was set up a tank and she had a pair of uh, maroon clowns and we had them for probably uh, 16 years. And, um, and they ended up uh, perishing uh, to a, my fault. Um, having a personal aquarium and trying to maintain 18,000 gallons of water, I neglected her tank. And of course I got blamed for killing her fish because I didn't have time to take care of it. <laughs> well, that and Amanda's a stud and it's obviously not her fault. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> It's always my fault, <laughs> but that's okay. I can take it. I'm a big boy. <laughs> so it's a, um, an orange shoulder tang. Um, I got it from Walt Smith in Fiji. It was about this big. It was wow. solid yellow. And in, I got that fish in 2000, when I was at 2000, 2012, right after we moved into the farm. I called Walt and got a whole bunch of tangs from Fiji to throw in the, the farm system when we moved from my house into the farm. And that fish has been with us the whole time. And then it took it until 2019. That fish was an almost an adult sized fish. Well, actually it was an adult sized fish at about 10 inches. It should have been adult colors. And um, it was in December of 19, we went on our break for our two week Christmas break every year that we do. And we did a massive water change on the farm system in the back. And I didn't see the fish until then. Well, no, it was the next day, Amanda and I came in and I'm like, where's my orange shoulder? And I'm looking around cause I'm looking for this big yellow fish with the orange shoulder on it. And I'm like, where the hell did my orange shoulder go? I'm freaking out. Well, he went from one day to the next day to a full blown bull male coloration, blue in the head, the perfect divided wow. line in his body is bright on his shoulder. And I'm like, wow, that's just cool. It's just a water change. And he freaking changed from juvenile to adult colors, literally overnight. Amanda's got a video of him before and after. I have to see if I can get her to dig it up and send it to you guys. If uh, that could be a tough, tough find. That's though. cool. Yeah. I see. Imagine what other cool stuff would happen if you did water changes. I won't have to worry about that now. I think it had a lot to do with the fact the fish wasn't getting its modern traces when it was drinking. <laughs> Sounds like a whole lot of rationalization. This yes, water change was aggressive. <laughs> well, to put it this way, three hours, four hours a week of water changes is gone. So I'll take that all day long. Yeah. And my corals have never looked better. I love my coral systems right now. They're just blowing my mind. Um, I got 13 new releases to send to the studio 
Um, I'll see if I can get them out next week. That's enough for a full box. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. A lot of well, people, I think a lot of people in the, uh, in the industry know that you and Jake were super tight, but I don't know if a lot of people in the hobby that may be listening to this know how close you and Jake were. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of had a, we talked a little bit at Aqua Shell at Dallas and how you guys would go around and you would find all the corals on the floor and all the cool ones. And, uh, in the latest video, which you can check out on our YouTube channel on the reef builders, YouTube channel, uh, I think you may have started a little Ganyastria craze and the hunt is on for everybody to find the most colorful Ganyastria because, uh, Tyson rich had one of the coolest corals and what you said, you've never seen in any of your importing career, which I think is a huge statement. Um, and I actually, I, I reached out to him and I was like, so how's that wait list on that Ghani Asher? And he's like, it's, it's kind of a mile long. So. <laughs> uh, I talked to him about it too. And I said, make sure you get your commission. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, when I was at the show, um, I asked him if he had a frag, he could save for me to send to me and he's going to send me a frag of it too. Um, but I've got, I guess Jake and I. We would go back and forth about the Ganyastria, Platygyra, Ganyastria, Platygyra, you know, and um, it's, uh, that was always a, a fun time just, you know, explaining why we thought it was Platygyra, why we thought it was Ganyastria, and um, I really got to know the corals extremely well. The difference between the two is night and day now, um, but I'd like to get a piece of this Ganyastria that I really liked from Richard, from Rich, uh, from Tyson, and um put it on the farm because he said his was two years and it was only about that big man he he, he might not like me because uh <laughs> I, I might be able to get it twice that size in like four months because um we have some gani astrias on the farm that as a matter of fact the boost in sales on gani astrias this week actually went through the roof like corals that we haven't been selling hardly at all all of a sudden people are like hey you got any of that silver thunder gani astria I'm like, yeah we got plenty of it you know like, what about the yeah. The, the firestorm, I'm like, that's a platygyra. <laughs> well, we like that too. The maze brain Kate, um, craze might have just kicked off a little bit. I hope it does because they don't sell very well. And we farm a lot of them. There's like nine or 10 different ones that we're farming right now. And a lot of them, I just stopped farming because they didn't sell. Um, but I really want that piece from him. Um, I don't know what he calls it, but it's Gani Astra Australiensis as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one of the, one of the most overlooked corals at the local fish store for sure um and and uh jake has a whole tank at the studio and that row of uh i forget what brand of tanks those are but the in the last yeah in the, in the last tank there's a whole bunch just tons of them and and they're so colorful but i think maybe why they're not as uh they, they come in like super small like people frag them up super small so you can't really see what they look like in that in that colonial form and exactly. it, it just it'll take your breath away i mean you put a bunch of those in a tank and it just, it really, it can really add some color and some pop to your tank. But, uh, it's people like you that I think will, will go, you know, all, all the nerds of the world and the coral world go, this is cool. That's why Jake made a long polyp toadstool popular because it's, it's, it's a pretty common coral kind of, I guess maybe not his, the, the strain unique. that he had, but it's unique. Yeah. But it's just a pink leather. You know what I mean? And, and I get, I get messages every single day about mine. Like, Hey, you got a frag of that. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really just about that extra added attention in scenarios like aqua shell of Dallas, or, you know, it gets featured in a video or something. Um, so yeah, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to make mention because uh, I think a lot of people, when, you know, a lot of stuff started happening at the Reef Builder studio where, you know, we saw a coral being taken out and things like that. You were actually a part of the, of the Andrew Sandler, um, uh, transport of a lot of the large colonies that, that Jake had. And it was kind of a, a to my understanding, it was kind of a, a little bit of a rehab situation on those corals. Can you, cause you were there packing these things, which I know was very stressful for you. <laughs> Can you take us through that? Well, uh, um, I say it started in the beginning of December. Um, Windsor contacted me and she asked me to find homes for the corals in the flats so that they had room to prune the display tanks because the flats were full of, um, basically prunes from the display tanks and, um, they didn't, 
you know, they were overgrown and it was a lot of the water flow was restricted because the corals had grown out so much. The corals weren't as happy. And of course, Jake was no longer there to, um, to, to, to work his magic um, on what he loved to do. And that was to make sure these things were healthy and happy. And so one person to do all of it was a, was a pretty big task. And um, the, uh, I guess a video came out in December, right after Windsor asked me to find homes for the corals in the flats that uh, Chris Cap was there and did a video with Evan about doing the um, dipping the corals in the flats. And I was like, oh God, you guys did not just do a video on those corals and how, I'll... now you, Windsor asked me to find homes for them. And I had so many people in mind, all these different um, people that respected Jake and um, wanted to help find them new homes. And as um, soon as that video came out, everybody was like, I don't want anything to do with that stuff. Leave me, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, what are we going to do here? So um, I, all the way up until right, be right before I went out, I had no idea what I was going to do. And um, I never spoke with Andrew before, ever. Um, I watched Polar Reef, uh, followed it, infatuated with his amazingly beautiful 17,000-gallon aquarium that I can't wait to go see in July. Um, and I just reached out to him and... Um, it blew my mind. He got back to me as quickly as he did. And he was very receptive. It's like, this is for Windsor. I want to help so badly. So you just tell me what is going to be done. What, what can be, you know, how it's going to go down and um, whatever you think the value of them is, you know, we'll give the, we'll give a donation to, uh, to Windsor to help her um, get on. And um, I couldn't have been more grateful to him. And when I told Windsor, she was extremely you know, excited, skeptical, you know, I was the same way too. I'm like, you know, I told him, I said, these things have pests. And he's like, so what are we going to do about that? And I'm like, well, I have to assess the situation. I said, I, I can't, I'm told there's pests there, but I don't know what it's like until I put my eyes on it. So I made my first trip out in January and, um, yeah, uh, my stress level from December all the way through to the last visit when all those corals left in boxes to go to Andrew. I don't think I had stress levels that high in my entire life because um, the task to rehome my best friend's corals to make sure that they were in the best possible shape that they could be in and me not being able to be there after I'm there the first time to be able to monitor things and make sure everything was still being, you know, okay. Uh, I didn't sleep for, I mean, literally for months, uh, my sleep, my sleep schedule was horrible. I had to talk to my doctor and have him just adjust things for me. Cause I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. I'm not, uh, uh, this is this, you know, and I think it had a lot to do with that. So I get to the studio and I didn't know where to begin. You know, uh, Rob Mouget was there. Larry, Larry, I can't pronounce his name, Lezinski was there. Um, Jack uh, from Merman's and uh, Gabe from Merman's and Evan was there. And uh, I just, at one point, I just grabbed the coral. It was like 9 a.m. the next day, because I was still just wrapping my head around what was going on in the studio and how to tackle it. I just grabbed the first coral and I started cutting. And I cut all the dead areas off. Um, I dipped the corals. I cleaned them up really good remounted them on tiles, put them back in the tank and said a little prayer saying, you know, I just hope that uh, we got everything that we could get that was on the coral. And uh, we literally from 9 a.m., Gabe and Jack left at 3 a.m. the next morning. And I still had more to do. Rob Mujay came back over on Saturday. I extended my stay by a day. Um, and we stayed up until after midnight on Saturday and all three of the coral flats were completely overhauled, cleaned out. All the corals were, were uh, dipped, inspected. Anything that was dead on them was, was taken off. Then when it, anything that we couldn't, of course, remount as a colony was, um, you know, mounted on frag plugs. And I don't know, six, 700 frags that we had made out of all the colonies and then all the big colonies that were there that were still in really good shape. And I left and um, I was just, I was on the phone with Windsor all the time. I was on the phone with, with Evan talking about the corals and I'm thinking everything's fine and dandy. Everything's good to go. And um, 
I got back out there and everything actually looked really good. Um, but I wasn't there doing all the testing and everything. And um, my task was to then the second time I went out there to box up, what was it? 34 colonies that were basketballs or bigger. And of course, everything that I was sending out, I had to make sure that, and I promised um, at that time it was Ryan, um, owner of Rebuilders, that everything was going to be that was in those flats. If there was something that was there that was not in the studio in one of the main tanks, that there was going to be um, transplants made. So I made sure I did all of that to make sure that the, all the corals were still going to be there. Some of the stuff was super common that, um, you know, I couldn't really find a good place to put it. So it wasn't like, um, I, I think I took a couple of those pieces because I think they were just something that was gnarly and something that only Jake would love because it was, you know, phosphorescent and absolutely stunning. It was just a really, you know, just a piece of coral, you know, Jake loved every coral. I don't, you know, if you don't know that about Jake, um, Jake loved every coral just because it was a coral. It didn't matter if it was phosphorescent and beautiful um, colors. Um, he's got out there at the studio now, the garden of Sarius. Um, most people would look at that and say, why do you want that ugly brown thing? It looks like a beehive. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what Jake That's was exactly doing. what I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, where do you see it now? Um, <laughs> I, to my surprise, I've had that coral since January and, um, it has turned this beautiful, <sighs> okay. Can't say it's beautiful. Um, it's not bright and shiny. It's, it's ugly. It's, it, it's got a cool pattern, pattern, yes. uh, growth patterns, right? It, it's, it's cool structure. It's dark green now. Um, that's about it. Yeah. That's about it's it. No, really? Yeah, it's no longer like that wow. tan yellow brown color. It's actually turned a very dark green. But having it that dark green, when you look at it, depending on the light you look at it, the, you know how deep the little valleys were between the coral and the, cor and the, and the polyps? Mm -hmm. It's so deep that it almost looks black with that green coming up the walls of the correlates. It's it's pretty cool. I, Interesting. I have to get you a photo of it. Um, yeah. You'll have to send me a picture. I will yeah. for sure. That was a monumental task <sighs> that that you took on. So I I was keeping tabs with with Amanda at that time. <laughs> we were talking about the progress and you know the the plan of what was going to happen and. Um, I made sure I was absolutely not going to be in Denver during that time because I know that I'd be put to work. I'd like you would. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Uh, <laughs> so th there was, a, you know, the, the flats are big. Yes. You know, when, you, when you say flats, I don't think people realize how big these grow out tanks were. And, th and this was Jake's playground, right? You, you have all of his main systems where all the main uh, colonies and, everything that you see on the videos that's in his main tanks but these were just grow out tanks where he would take frags and just grow stuff out he had no nothing to do with it so he tossed them in there and it was you know one giant flat which grew into a second giant flat right it's that problem that we have that we just continue to expand well he did that and then that's the addiction growing and growing and growing <laughs> That's it's a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. <laughs> lifestyle. It is a lifestyle, but there's an addiction part of it too. I'm sorry, it is. is gambling also a lifestyle. <laughs> Addictions can be treated. This is a lifestyle. No treatment needed, except for a little bit of refill. See now, I like that even better. It's a lifestyle. There's no treatment necessary. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll stop saying addiction. No treatment necessary. <laughs> but but the flats are huge. Eight by four. And they hold so much. Yeah. 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 And you're talking three. So that, that was a lot of work. Eight, three, eight, three, eight by fours. I mean, at the end of each day um, that I was out there working on those things, um, I was exhausted. I mean, and then I don't sleep when I'm not at my home very well. You sounded exhausted because I think we had a we call did. during one of those days. <laughs> I was hurt. You were beat. <laughs> I tell you what, I felt like I had jet lag when I moved, when I came back to Florida. The first two days I was back, I was like, uh, I thought you come back from Indonesia. <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it was tough uh, to get back on schedule. Um, <laughs> but I think the biggest, I, I knew that I could get out there and if I had the right people with me that I could guide people the right way to get the corals, you know, cleaned up. I didn't think that was going to be any issue whatsoever. Because, I mean, we did our damnedest to make sure that there was not a speck of rock or a speck of old tile left 
when we were done cleaning up the corals and that's a sure fine way to get rid of the eggs and i know it's not foolproof yeah. but it's a heck of a lot better than leaving some rocks stuck to the coral that could have eggs that you can't see so that's why we did things the way we did them out there and when i came back um to pack the corals up to send to andrew um the, that monumental task was um probably the biggest weight on my shoulders out of any of it because i mean if you're listening to this and, and, and knew anything about shipping corals, most people don't ship big corals and they don't ship big corals for a reason. Um, you have to really know what you're doing to be able to take an Acropora colony the size of a basketball and put it inside of a box and make sure that it gets from point A to point B, first of all, without getting broken into a bazillion pieces. Second of all, um, making sure that you have... Um, packed it properly so that the, the the coral doesn't foul out the water and kill itself on travel and that can take literally six to 12 hours if you don't do it right and i think that was where my head was um had the hardest time wrapping around what to do because i've shipped big colonies in the past but i've never shipped like 34 big colonies in the past and the fact that you know they're jakes they're irreplaceable well you can get your fragments of them because you know there was plenty of colonies that weren't they sure as heck weren't going to rip out of the studio to replace you know i had to make sure that i was on point 100 percent on the top of my game when i packed up these corals and thank goodness that rob and and larry and jack were there with me the whole time i started packing corals at 5 a.m and i literally did not stop until noon um and then we left the damn studio like just like five minutes late and I missed the first flight and I, my heart sunk. I was like, Oh my God, we just packed up all this coral. There's one more flight direct to Andrew. And luckily I'm standing there and the lady's like, what are you worried about? And I'm like, I'm worried about you getting him on this plane. Cause this is like 2,700 pounds going on a domestic airline. They're going to bump my cargo before they bump a passenger. And, and, and I said, I'm freaking out. I'm like, this flight doesn't leave till four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm leaving it with you. And I, I, luckily the people that were there were great. And I said, you know, here's my cell phone. Number. actually, here's my business card. Call the cell phone number. If this is not going to go on the plane, I need to come and pick it up immediately, bring it back, unpack it, stay an extra day, repack it again. But luckily, um, yeah it all made it and there was zero losses. And, um, I sat up at uh, two o'clock in the morning, watched Andrew and his whole crew unpack the entire thing on Instagram live and was helping them identify the corals. And I was like, uh, oh, the, the weight was gone. And actually I came home and my stress level was gone. I never had that whole, my, I mean, I literally couldn't stop, you know, winds are put, put well, just to get that stress level up a little bit. We'll be out there in a couple of weeks. <laughs> To see how they're doing. <laughs> awesome. Out where? Yeah. Where are you going to be? Uh, to Andrews. Oh, you are? Andrews, awesome. So. I'm going to be out there in July. Okay. Well, when in July? Uh, well, the first is on Saturday, so it'll be sometime between Monday and Friday um, after the first. Got it. So early July. All right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be there in a few weeks to, awesome. uh, to check the progress on those and you know, see how everything's going and how they're taking care of Jake's, Jake's corals. Yeah. I mean, he's got the, you know, it'll be interesting. Uh, there's so many corals that Jake hand collected, you know, um, the, the hard line hooks him. I, I mean, the studio has got an amazing piece of that. Well, nice thing is these are the grow out corals, right? We yeah. still have all of Jake's main colonies. So the studio this just, this, this serves as almost a bank, a bank, a bank. A, yeah, Jake. Jake and I. Now you said uh, you said Acropora, not Acropora. So I say Acropora. <laughs> Monty. Um, I say Monopora. What about Monty? It's okay. Montipora. Okay. Ac not Montipora. Montipora, Acropora. <laughs> I like Acropora and I like Monopora. Um, if you, it's a potato, potato, <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> you know, it's the way I look at it. I mean, uh, most people I talk to say Acropora. Even Jake said Acropora. And we went back and forth about Acropora and Acropora many times. And he's like, I don't care. It's Acropora to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I prefer Acropora too. Yep. I just say wow. Acro for short most of the time. <laughs> I, 
as many people can see from uh, so the by the time this is out for people the studio walk around video is up and i think one of the things that surprised me about going to because i was at, i was there at reef stock there was just so many dang people in the studio and it was hard to actually to take a second to actually sit in front of a tank and observe and see all the nooks and crannies and see all the different corals that were uh, represented in these display tanks and in the flats. So we got a chance to go out there and it was literally just myself, Jack and Jimmy, a videographer. It was, it was pretty surreal to be amongst Jake's genius in that studio and just to see all the amazing different, you know, corals that he had collected over over time i think one of my favorites and i know this is kind of a weird one was the uh the turbinaria heronensis yeah you get the, that from me gosh it's so cool and i saw it and i was like what what is that and and uh jack had come over and said it was the turbinaria it just had a it's got an interesting growth pattern and it's kind of iridescent it's not super flashy but i thought that was really cool and then just to see the immortal tort in person and he's got the, so each one of the, the the peninsulas has a large chunky frag in there, and it's just it it, it just takes your breath away. And, and the does. studio is super clean. I think Jack's doing a great job there. Jack is doing an awesome job. It, it, one of the coolest things about it was after Reef Stock, um, just going through going through the studio just. Meckley and I were going, you know, you're telling me these stories uh, about each individual coral. Oh, this is where we collected this. And this is the conversation with Jake. And just, you know, the, we didn't have a ton of people there. It was just it was a nice. few of us. And it was nice, right? It, it, it was. It was difficult. Um, it, was, it was difficult, but it was nice. Like, it, it, it was, it was hard to explain. But it's one of my most cherished memories there um just hearing that history and hearing the stories and seeing it and just being there and we only had a short period of time to do it man i i, I tell you what raj i mean if you ever want to put a, uh put something together where you want to go to the studio and you want me to come out there and we can spend a weekend there or something dude i i, I tell you what i was at that studio by myself um, more than I ever thought I'd ever be there just to you know back in January and, and, and February. Um, it was, uh, you're right. Very, very surreal, you know, looking at something and going, yeah. wow, you know what Jake still has this piece. I'm like, yeah, you know, it was so far. I actually, I actually lost my shit <laughs> when I was out there the first time. Cause I lost a very, very, very important mono monopora for me. I got a hitchhiker Monty. Um, I think I have to look at my notes. I think it was in 2014 or 2015 from a Vietnam Zoanthid. I was going around with my flashlight like I always did, just to see if I was any cool shiny hitchhikers on the Zoanthids, because Vietnam is like notorious for sending some really cool corals over, not even knowing they're coming over. And Amanda and I were doing it. We were walking around with little flashlights, and I saw this little teeny speck about the size of my pinky nail, and it had these bright yellow polyps and I plucked it off, stuck it on a frag plug and forgot about it. You know, stuck it in the farm, just left it, you know, going. And when I finally was looking at the farm one day, probably six months, eight months later, this thing turned this bright red with these fluorescent yellow polyps and it's a little money. And I'm like, that's a little devil eye right there. And she's like, why are you calling it the devil eye? I'm like, look at the eyes. I'm like, it's bright yellow. I'm like, and that little devil just came out of nowhere. I'm like, devil eye. <laughs> and um, I told Jake about it. And um, he's like, can you guys send me a piece? I'm like, yeah, I'll get you one out. And I forgot to send him one. I kept forgetting, kept forgetting every time I would send him out corals. And I sent it to him probably in 2021. I lost all of mine. Uh, I lost. A, uh, I had some issues with Monty Nudies. I still have the damn issues. I'm not afraid to say it either. But <laughs> um, one of my employees was supposed to be taking care of them, them really well. We launched it, and we sold a lot of them. And then I lost every last piece of it that I had. And when I was at the studio, that coral has so much meaning to me from all we've done to get it to where it was, to sellable in the market from a piece this big to selling 100 frags available. Um, 
I saw it and I just started bowling. I was like, I lost my shit right there. I'm like, Jake still has my devil eye. I mean, I'm getting weird right now because it's like, you know, I got the piece of coral back in my possession because Jake and I banked corals with each other all the time. And I forgot I even sent it to him. And I was just so happy to be able to get that piece back. I cut the entire colony in half, put one half on the, on the, in the flats on the rack where I was. And I put the other half over here and was just like, you need to take that back home with you. <laughs> and it's still out there. I had Jay, uh, Jack showed me a fi uh, picture of it, a uh, video of it, um, I guess three or four weeks ago. And he was like, how's everything looking, Chris? I'm like, just keep doing what I say, bro. You got it covered, man. Everything's looking amazing. <laughs> Which tank is that in? I think he's got it in the, um, the, uh, uh, what is it? The, it's the peninsula. I can't remember. The water box and the Red Sea. It's the Red Sea. Okay. I'm pretty I'll, sure I'll look. I've got, sea. I've got a ton of footage that I'm going through right now, so I'll look for it. You and if I pink. can, you can go on to ACI, my website. And, oh, no, it's not for sale right now. So it's probably not going to show. It might still be up there under aquacultured corals, just not available or out of stock. And it, you can see it's so a bright red with um, yellow polyps. Um, really cool coral. Got a cool story to it, too. Deserves a name because it's got a cool story. That, that was the surreal part about that night. Yeah. Or, or that day, it was during the day, you know, Chris Carney was there too, yes. and we're going through, you know, just stories. Yep. Uh, we're, we're reminiscing uh, on these stories with Jake and gosh, the early days of reef stock and I know. Uh, how small and intimate it was and just kind of how he built it up and sleeping on his couch and, you know, the, the hotel of choice for a reef stock at that point was at the La Quinta Inn. Yeah. Uh, yes. and, and to just, see, you remember that? I do, I do. <laughs> so moving from the La Quinta out and, 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 but you, we would go through these, these stories and these memories where we're laughing and then we would hit that point, right? That somber point that we realize, well, Jake's no longer there. Yeah. And this isn't, this isn't going to be the same. It's going to be different. It is. And, we have to do things. We have to take care of these things. Like he's put these things out here for, for us. And now there's, there's frag Adams that, uh, at that point was, you know, pending, uh, now frag Adams is here. Uh, so there, you know, we, I want him to see all of these things that his dad built. Exactly. Uh, that is going to be so cool. I mean, think about that. Yes. When he grows up and he gets to see all of these things, you know, the, the reef stocks and the reef builders and the reef therapy, the corals, and videos and the corals. Just how many of us get to have our lives recorded in a way where you, our kids can follow it along and see yep. all the things that we've built and done? Yeah, that's going to be so. So cool. It's going to be awesome. I mean, you know, I was talking to Windsor tonight. I actually got a call from, you know, this Carolina Reefing Expo is going on this weekend um, up in Carolina. And I know Grace pretty well. And um, somebody that knows Windsor and Jake proposed something to to, to uh, Grace uh, to do for Reef. Not not for, not in memory of Jake, not anything to do with Windsor, but this is 100% about Reef. And... Um, Grace didn't know this girl that proposed this, um, Heather McNeil. Um, I don't know if you guys know who she is, um, yeah. but um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know her personally. And Grace doesn't know her well enough. So Grace asked me about this proposal that she came up with. And I'm like, you know what? I'm like, I really think Windsor would absolutely love it if it was specifically a gift for Reef. So that way when Reef is old enough to, to, to read and see and understand that, you know, this was done, you know, basically one, one week after Reef was born, you know, um, and then I gave her a little idea on top of it, you know, they were going to do this painting, it says, welcome to Carolinas, uh, Reef Jacob Windsor Adams, and then it was a picture um, that Windsor had posted on Facebook of Reef cuddled in a monopora cap, and then a Reef scene behind it. <laughs> And then um, a big open ocean area, a blue for people to sign. And I said, that would be great, but that's not going to mean anything except for all these people. Who are they? What, who are they? Now you need to get a little log book that each person that signs it can say something about Jake and what he meant, what they, what Jake meant to them 
in the hobby or as a person. So that way, when Reef is old enough to understand and comprehend all that, that the little guy is going to be able to see what, how many people's lives he touched and made and, and helped and just guided along the way in this amazing um, hobby that we have that's a lifestyle. <laughs> you know? Um, and Windsor was like, I mean, she almost started crying. I could just hear it in the voice. She was so excited about it. And um, so, yeah, that's going to be really cool to see that, how that is. I can't wait. To, uh, I'm going to try to visit her when I'm up in Pennsylvania on our way back to the airport, go down and take a detour and go see Reef and uh, maybe this little uh, thing that's put together this weekend for, uh, for Reef. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. I think it, that's cool. there's not too many people that have several different legacies in all the coral that they raised and a YouTube channel and <laughs> progeny at the same time. It's, it's, uh, you know, he, he, he'll never be forgotten. A lot of this coral that he's had will outlive all of us. So, yeah, we hope, you know, definitely. I mean, yeah. I'm, I've got pieces of everything that I have that is from Jake. We have pieces of it in every single farm system because you have to, and then I'm trying to bank it with local stores, you know, <laughs> You know, this is a super important piece. You know, you guard it with your life. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, I send out a big piece of uh, Jake's Manila Spy because Jake, when he sent it to me in 2021, he goes, sell it high because you'll never get that again because everybody's going to have it. And sure enough, I can't, I can't give this stuff away now. Um, <laughs> so I, I put this big colony up for sale and I, I put 60 bucks on it in uh, wholesale and somebody's like, why so cheap? I'm like, do you want it? He's like, yeah. I'm like, you understand once you receive it. <laughs> and I, I packed that thing the best possible way I could ever think of. I cannot think of another way to pack it so that it wouldn't be busted into a million pieces. Because all it takes is for you to go, <sighs> and it breaks, you know? So imagine being in the UPS box or even in a, a, an airline just being tossed one time. It shattered. The guy calls me. He's like, dude, he's like, what am I supposed to do with all these fragments? And I'm like, mount them on plugs and sell them for 10 bucks a piece. Make your money back, <laughs> but make sure you call it the Jake Adams Manila Spy. <laughs> and um, you know, it's uh, it's funny how that works out. But um, that coral, you know, the whole story on the Manila Spy. No. Tell us. Oh my gosh, the Manila Spy. It's from Manila, Philippines, and as everybody knows, you cannot get corals out of the Philippines legally. Somebody ended up smuggling it out of the Philippines to Dubai. Okay, so when Jake was in Dubai one time, he saw this coral and he's like, I, I got to have this. I, I got to have it. So, um, of course, he told a bunch of people in Indonesia because he was, I guess, on his way there. And somehow, where or another, a piece of it ended up in Indonesia. And then it ended up over here, legally imported in the United States under a monopora sites. But Monopora, it was thought that it was Monopora hirsuta. And it's actually, um, this was just last summer, Jake figured it out um, through all the new taxonomy coming through. It's, it's Monopora carinata. So this coral has made it from, you know, uh, and I don't recommend anybody do any of this stuff. I mean, you know, and Jake was not a part of it as well. Um, somebody just happened to get it and in, inquire it and then it ended up going into, I think, unique corals. And then Unique Coral sent it to Jake, and Jake had it for a handful of years. And um, every bit of it that's in the United States came from a piece of coral that was this big brought into the United States with a permit. Wow. And hmm. it is, if you put it all together, it'd probably fill this whole damn room that I'm in right now. <laughs> it grows so <laughs> doggone fast. But um, that's why he called it the Manila Spy, because, um, you know, <laughs> it just fits the coral very well, gotcha. in my opinion. So. I have the story up on um, my, my wholesale website. Um, I try to put a story on every single coral that we put a name on. We don't yeah. just use the name to market the coral. Um, like most of these Looney Tune names are nowadays, they don't really mean anything. There's no lineage to anything. It's just a wild coral cut up. Oh, we're going to call it blah, blah, blah. And if it catches, people go crazy over it. Um, just like um, my little harebrained idea with the uh, Royal Court of Finverphilia Para Encora that uh, Reef Builders so kindly blew up after we launched them and it blew up. I do, I cannot 
tell you how many messages I get on a weekly basis. When's the royal court going to be available? And I'm like, <laughs> do you think that I grow these corals that fast? <laughs> I'm, I'm good, but I'm not that damn good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For those I mean, that are wondering, the Manila spy is uh it's it's a like a branching mani, right? It's monopora carinata. It's a branching monopora. And yeah. it's super thin. It almost super it almost like it almost looks like at the tips of it it flattens out a little bit. It does. It does. Um it's if anybody knows like uh the old school ORA um Elkhorn monopora, that's what we originally thought it was. But then when Jake sent me the piece that I had, I'm looking at it, I'm like, Jake, it's not Hirsuta. I'm like, I've got three different color morphs for Hirsuta growing right here. And it's just smooth. It's, it's, you know, and then I was looking right next to it, there's this Monopora setosa that I've been growing. And I'm like, you know what? It looks like these two corals, the setosa and the Hirsuta crossbred and took on the color of the setosa, the red. And yeah. got rid of the brown that was uh, her suit. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, I think you're right. He's like, you know, I got I to gotta dig into this more. And then I guess um, I, I'm horrible with names, but there's a, a scientist over in Australia. Last name is Russell. Oh, yeah. Russell Kelly. Russell yeah, Kelly? Russell. No. Yeah, Russell Kelly. It is Russell Kelly. Um, I thought his last name was Russell. But okay, Russell Kelly. Yeah, I, I've talked to him a handful of times. I'm just horrible with names. But he was talking. People with two first names. <laughs> right? So he, um, yeah, we have those books. We actually sell those books and we actually move a lot of them for him. Um, I can't wait to meet that guy someday. I'm hoping that if I make it to Australia in the next uh, year or so, that I'll get a chance to go up and meet him. Um, it fascinates me what he's doing with the taxonomy and stuff. But I guess it was Russell Kelly and him um, figured out that it was. Uh, a new classification and Monopora carinata is what the species is. So it's, it's definitely different from the Hirsuta, but um, not dense and tight growth like a Setosa. Um, very, very, uh, I guess, lagoon style type growth because there's not a lot of flow because I can't see this coral growing in the wild to getting bigger than like this big before a wave came through and said, Push. <laughs> water must be still. Well, you know, what's really cool. Um, we manipulated the growth on it in the farm. Um, I have so much water flow in my systems that I mounted a uh, frag horizontally on a tile, just kind of laid it down and glued it. And it started growing out and the branches that started to grow up, they grew up maybe a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, and then they just started growing this way, horizontally. So the colony is really cool because you can see it kind of looks like a wheel. You got the centerpiece where I put it, and then you got all these spindles growing out of it. Um, I, that's actually probably a really good picture and a really good story to write for reef builders. I should, uh, I should put that out there. Jake, Jake would actually love that. He'd look down with a big fat smile on his face and say, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Write it up. Do it. I'll have to do it. I got to get some time. Um, I'm going to send over a handful of articles to you at some point and that you guys can put out whenever you want to. I just don't want people to think that I'm promoting my company, Raj. That's my biggest concern. I, I'm just going to use my name as the writer and with Amanda doing the writing. And um, I don't want to mention you know, my company at all. I just don't want people to think I'm trying to promote ACI through reef builders. That's just how I've always felt about it. Yeah. I, look, I get that totally 100%, right? Because I got a lot of that uh, question. Like, even if I, I never mentioned the company. I, I, I think it was in my bio. And initially I got attacked like, oh my God, the guy's a giant shell. I'm like, well, I, I haven't actually said anything right. at all. It's because nobody can um, afford your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I want to have a task for him when I get my new farm system going to build me a huge roller. <laughs> I was going to say, well, both of you guys are kind of, you, you don't necessarily sell to the hobbyist typically anyway. So it's, nope. I, I think you're, I think you're good. I think you're, yeah, it's, I don't I I, you know, there's a lot of, that, um, that there's way. a lot of projects and builds and things that I want to share with people just because they're cool. Um, not so much that I'm trying to look, promote MRC, right? It's not an advertisement, but it's like, hey, this is a cool project that you'll never get to see otherwise just because of the way that it is or who it is. Um, they're, they're not going to post this on, online or, you know, and they're, 
their people are not going to post it online and things like that. And it's, it's giving people that access to see these things. Um, people are going to think what they're going to think. So you're, just roll with it. You're always going to have haters out and, there. I'll be good. Uh, <laughs> just smile when the haters keep talking. Cause um, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually laugh at that kind of stuff all the time. Now, Jake, Jake, it took a while for me to get to get over the whole hater thing and the the the, the trolls, as he would call it. Um, he's like, "Don't feed the trolls. Yeah, don't feed the trolls, and you'll be just fine." <laughs> uh, the the haters don't bother me. That's you know, people are going to think what they're going to think. They're, they're entitled to it. They're free to express themselves. I'll, I'll take the criticism, you know, whether I deserve it or not. It doesn't matter. Um, and sometimes they may hit it. Yeah, they may get me. Hey, and I'm fine with that. And I say that all the time. That gotcha. And if they if they have the gotcha moment, I'll tell them. I was like, yeah, my bad. Uh, you got me. I, I I say it all the time. Prove me wrong, and I'll take it. I'm a big boy. <laughs> it means I learned something new. If you prove me wrong, I learned something I didn't already know. And that is what this is all about. I learn something new every single day with what I do with the farming corals. And honestly. Yeah. With my ADHD brain, if I didn't have um, something like reefing to, to keep me occupied, I don't even know what I'd do. I mean, I'd be a mess. So speaking of learning, yep. right, why, why don't we make this a teaching moment? What's uh, your ideal pH, calcium level, alkalinity? I'm going to hit you with the big three. The big. You're on the spot. I have to say I do the big four. It's pH is first for me. Let's go. I do not... Okay. Uh, I look at my pH first, and as a hobbyist, if you if you cannot reach what I reach, it's because you're not going to be told how to use certain products that are not really feasible for small systems to be utilized on. And the ones that don't listen to me and they try it on their own show me pictures of ghost white tanks, and it really upsets me to see that. So well, Talkwasser – to get your pH to whatever you can max it out at. Yep. To what number? Yep. What's the number? I say your magic number in a, as a hobbyist is if you can keep it so that it does not go, go below 8.2, you're golden. Um, if you can reach the goals that wow. we reach, which is I, I, I have my shut off on the caulk washer at 8.29. Um, and I keep mine stable at the 8.29 with other hydroxides that we're not going to talk about. Um, <laughs> So that way, uh, I'm farming corals. It's my livelihood. It's, I want to grow these corals faster. As a hobbyist, you don't need to do what we do. If you boost your suppressed pH from being you know, 7.6 to 7.8 at your valley, which is not healthy for your corals. I don't care what anybody says. That's not natural. Um, so my, my goal for every hobbyist would be 8.2 minimum pH. Um, peak out whatever it peaks out at because you're going to keep your pH from being suppressed at nighttime and photosynthesis during the day. will just take it where it's going to take it at that point. Um, alkalinity. I honestly really don't care about alkalinity anymore. Now that I keep my pH where it is. Um, I, I, I have still in my head, I still haven't gotten out of my head. Um, 8.3 is my target. Um, and that's what my target was before I started getting my pH, um, stabilized at the 8.29 mark, 8.3 mark. Um, but I found that when your pH is stable and your calcium reactor runs out of CO2 on a, on a Saturday and you got complacent and didn't monitor your alkalinity all weekend long and you come in and you have a 6.7 alkalinity and your corals look amazing, that alkalinity at natural seawater levels at 6.7 to 7.6 is really not a bad thing if you have a pH stable at 8.3. Um, if you don't keep your pH stable at 8.3, then run your alkalinity, you know, 8.3 to 9, 9.5. Um, calcium, I like the low side, 390, 420. That's where I try to keep my target for, for calcium. Um, anything above that is a money pit. It's a waste of money. It's not going to, the corals cannot utilize it. It's there. And you're chasing it constantly. So why would you waste your money chasing something the corals can't even use? Um, so 390 is where I like to target. But if it goes up to 420, I'm happy with that too. I don't like it going higher than that. Magnesium, that's a little bit different story depending on the system that I have. Um, my monopores, they love 14, 1450. 
Um, so do all the other corals, but I don't keep my systems that don't have Monty's in at 14, 14, 50. I keep them around 1250 to 1350. So I like a range. I don't think that um, targeting a certain number on um, say alkalinity, calcium and magnesium is as important as keeping your pH stable. And I've been reefing for 28 years and I started dosing talc washer when I was first started reefing and loved my aquariums, had the best acro tank I ever had um, until now um, with dosing talc washer. I got away from it when the whole balling method came on with, you know, three-part dosing. And I look back when I started doing talc washer again and going, damn, what's wrong with you, dude? You, you just started wasting all of your money on these buffers and all this other stuff when Kalk washer was cheap and you never tested your water and you had a successful reef tank for five years dosing Kalk washer without ever testing a damn thing, just making sure you did consistent Kalk washer doses. And now here I am chasing all these numbers and I'm worried about them and my money pit has gotten so deep that, I mean, when we started doing the Kalk washer and stopped chasing our alkalinity and calcium and magnesium and just started chasing our pH, with Kalkwasser, I started saving, we saved $15,000 on my farm the first year we did it. I mean, if anybody doesn't want to save 15 grand, uh, I'll do the method for you and I'll take the money. <laughs> I, th I think that's a record for the number of times Kalkwasser has been said on Reef Therapy. There you go. Well, you just finally got me on board. <laughs> I, yeah, I was going to, I was going to say, we're going to do a whole entire podcast and we're not going to mention Cal Closser once because that's all Chris talks about ever. <laughs> I, I don't like, I mean, I, I talk about it so much because it's so practical and it's so cheap and it, and it works and, and it's tasty. Mm, so tasty. <laughs> um, it's also a good CO2 scrubber for your, um, air intake of your, um, of your protein skimmer. So, yeah, it's got multiple good uses. You can also make pickles with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, Chris, before we get out of here, uh, we had talked earlier today just briefly, and mm -hmm. you had mentioned a couple corals that you're super excited about that you guys just got on the farm. Can you take us through a couple of the ones that you're, you're really excited about right now that you have uh, in? I wish I could share this with Jake so bad because, you know, I remember um, having the discussion about turbine, uh, uh, Galaxia horizons. Um and I, I guarantee you 90% of the reefers, maybe more than 90% have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and probably didn't even know there was a species of Galaxia that branches like a, an Acropora um, or a branching Monty. I mean, it actually probably looks, branches more like a Digitata type coral than anything else. But um, I've been searching for a colorful uh, mono, or, monopore, uh, Galaxia horizons for probably over a decade. And when I told Jake that one of my holy grail corals was the branching galaxia, he's like, dude, they're brown. You're never going to see one with color. He's like, you know, that's it. And I gave my Aussie diver um, that I've been, do you know, been friends with uh, for the past 14 years. I gave him the task probably about 10 years ago. I'm like, you've got to find me something other than brown in galaxia horizons. And um, he did in January and he kept it till I got my shipment and I think it was February or March and I got five pieces of it and it is the coolest freaking coral I mean these thick branches the size of your the thickness of your thumb tapering up to the size of your pinky and galaxia coral lights growing all around it yeah it looks zero, really cool zero polyp extension so it's like the galaxia everybody would always want because there's no sweepers I've oh. never seen I've had it since Ooh. March. There's not a single sweeper that I've ever seen come out of this coral. And I've even been there at like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, get my flashlight out going, does the galaxy have polyps out? Why doesn't this thing polyp out? And I can't figure it out. It does not polyp out at all, but it's growing. Um, toxic neon well, green. Well, now that you said that, it's going <laughs> to yeah. do it tonight. And it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go in and be like, why'd they all die over here? <laughs> Just glancing over at my galaxy that I have on a frag rack over here, and it's just like there's probably 25 sweepers right now. Just 
You should see it at nighttime, Remy. Get, get your flashlight out at three o'clock in the morning when the sweepers are two foot long on your little one inch frag. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah what the hell yeah. is that? <laughs> so what so, color is it? It's neon green on the every coral light is neon green or every polyp. Um, and the body is just turd brown. I mean, it is turd brown. That's all I can say. It's it's brown with bright green, you know, correlates on it. Um, it's extremely cool and beautiful at the same time. And then um, another coral that I was telling you about earlier, Remy, um, I have to go back through my notes. I never even got a chance to go look up what species it is. Um, it's a Leptoceris and it grows in this, I don't even know how to say it. I mean, it's like super thin, like almost like, uh, uh, let's see, index card thickness cardboard, but you know, like the backing you would get on that, um, some way you tear off the sheets and you have that little cardboard sheet on the back of it. It's about that thick. So very thin, but grows in this meandering pattern on each branch that comes up. And it kind of like paddles out, then gets thin, and it's like, I got to get a total of it, too. Does it grow it's like so, a Monty? No. 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 Not a, no, not a Monty at all. It's like um, there's a piece of uh, Leptoceris that grows very similar. It's called the Papaya, P-A-P-Y-A-E, I think is how you, pron how you spell it. Um, I'm never good with Latin pronunciations until you know, Jake always corrected me on that all the time. It's like, yes, Jake, I know I can't pronounce it. <laughs> How do you say it, brother? <laughs> Help a brother out. <laughs> um, papaya, papaya is what they call it. They call it the papyra um, leptoceris. But it grows kind of in like a, like a fan shape, real thin. And each of the um, branches say they curl. This is like okay. that, but they are tight. Like it doesn't branch out. And they're super tight. This piece is like... I don't know, take two grapefruits, put them together and smash them. And it's about that size. Huh? And it's just really cool growth structure. And that was like one of my second favorite corals and they're not attractive. And this thing's brown as brown can be, but I, I tasked my Indonesian supplier probably seven or eight years ago to find this coral for me. And I just got it last week and I'm like, Oh, and there's and there's a cool zoanthid growing with it too. <laughs> so, um, but that's uh, I gotta find the species. Leptoceris. I'll have the species Paparacea? name. Huh? Paparacea. Paparacea is the one that's very similar, but similar kind of to it. Okay. Fans out a little bit. This other one is real tight in growth. Um, and I took my I took my Verone books to the uh, to the farm, so I don't have them here. But I will get you photos, and I will get you. Um, uh, the full Latin name, um, before you're able to put this out that way, it, uh, it goes up with everything correct. For sure. But that's for a sure. highlight for me in 15 years of importing corals, finally getting something that um, I've never seen in person before. And then actually, I think there's probably been a half a dozen or more corals that have come in this year that I've never seen in all the importing years. Um, that's been some of the highlights. I actually... Every year, that's my highlight is finding something I've never seen before. Yeah, I feel like that's the thing that uh, you know the antithesis of the beginner fluorescent corals that draws kind of the beginner hobbyist in, and then once you make it past that one to two year mark, you start kind of looking for the weird stuff. And and I I like that that you're bringing up like a branching galaxia or like this Leptoceris because it's stuff that you know, people don't see every day and it, it doesn't matter if it's brown, it doesn't matter whatever, if it has a little bit of a story behind it, that's, that's really all that matters. I think. Ah, uh, I just remembered the, the chip Pavona. Do you guys remember what the chip Pavona oh, yeah. is? The green yeah. kind of grows cactus. real cactus, very similar to the growth pattern of the, uh, Pavona cactus. Um, but much smaller, much thinner and just, yeah, a little bit different. Um, you'll you'll like it once you see it. It's pretty cool. Awesome, awesome. You guys have anything else you want to talk about? I mean, we could you, talk forever. Yeah, we could. I could go on for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed this, guys. I appreciate it. 
Oh, good. This was fun. I think it's a video in the making with having all of us at the studio and you kind of taking us around and, and really diving deep. Because we, we, in the video that's up, we kind of glossed over just to show everybody that everything is still there. Everything still exists. It's doing well. And that was kind of my goal with this is just to kind of show everybody the studio because this will be the first time that people have really seen it, seen it since Jake's passing. But I think it'd be a lot of fun to go in and do some story time with Chris Meckley on specific yep. species of coral. I, I think to. that'd be really fun. I would absolutely love to do that with you guys. Uh, you just pick the time and the date and um, I'll let you know if it works and uh, we'll make it happen. Bet. We'll schedule that up because that'll be fun. That yeah, would be a lot sure. of fun. You know? For sure. Very, very cool. Well, I want to thank you uh, for joining us, Chris. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Um, if you have any questions for Chris or Raj or myself, please put them down in the comments section below. We'll do our best to get to those. Remember to use the code RT10 when you grab an ICP test at icpanalysis.com. We did have a couple. We had a commenter, uh, Warzone Earth, said thanks for the code. Uh, got a two-pack. So he got 10% off that two-pack. So. Uh, really cool. cool. And and after our talk tonight, I feel like, you know, ICP tests are valuable and, and you can really, really get some stuff from some good information from those tests. So make sure, sure to do those if you can. Chris, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we will see you next time. See thank you guys. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Remy. Take care, Bye, guys. guys.